Because I have found that, at least for me, having self-belief generally, just that general pervasive self-belief that goes with me into any given situation is really a struggle. Mm -hmm. I found that it is more situational. Uh, there are some, some cases where I, I feel very at peace. Mm -hmm. There's no self-consciousness right. or negative self-awareness at all. Yeah. I have a handful of those, those situations. But then I have others where I feel like a complete doofus. <laughs> and I have zero belief in my ability right. to do anything in regards to that. Advanced math being one of those. But that's... <laughs> Welcome to the Serve Love Lift podcast. I'm Tiffany Garvin. Years ago on a quiet beach in Hawaii, I felt the weight of the pain and struggles we all face in this world and how much we need each other. Soon after, this movement was born to serve, love, and lift. I believe that we are meant to serve the world with our unique gifts, love ourselves and others, and lift each other up to live with joy. This podcast is here to help you heal your heart and your life and empower you on your path to becoming the best version of yourself. I invite you to listen carefully and jot down notes that come to mind, whether they come from me or from your own heart. Then, share this episode with three people who you feel could use it today. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get going. As women, we often doubt our strength, and goodness. We dismiss our gifts and all we have to offer the world instead of owning our worth, abilities, resilience, and significance. This can develop because of past experiences, our wounds, other people's voices in our heads, society's definition of beauty and success, and a million other things. Sometimes it's just easier to believe the negative instead of fighting for ourselves. And the thing is, we all know this needs to change. And there's a part of us that knows who we are and all the beauty inside of us, especially as we look at our daughters, sisters, friends, and other amazing women around us. We see them and all their goodness, even when they can't. It's the same with us. They can see our truth, even when we can't. It's critical that we begin believing in ourselves more and showing up fully as ourselves in all our glory, with confidence and posture, without apologies for our presence. Now, this is not showing up as overbearing, opinionated, or better than anyone else. It's not the old feminism that bashes men or incites women to demands and entitlement. This is balanced healthy, inner resolve that we have a right to joy, peace, and success in all areas of our lives. To drive home the point, I asked my sweetheart to join me on this episode to reinforce, from a man's perspective as well, the importance of us building a strong sense of belief in ourselves. Thanks for joining me, Chris. I love it when we can share these thoughts together. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So I'd love to highlight four absolute truths that we want you to understand. The more you believe in them, the better you can show up as your true, beautiful self. So Chris, this is something that we talked about many, many years ago, and it's been a remarkable blessing to us over the last several years. Yeah, it began when we were really diving into this concept of beliefs and seeing them as things more than just as, you know, ethereal untouchables. Right. Intangible. Intangible. There you go. We started out looking at these as core beliefs. Then we began to understand them as absolute truths. Yeah. And it was just our perception of them that we recognized were the beliefs. But they, in and of themselves, they are truths. Exactly. Which is why we call them the absolutes, the four yeah. absolutes. 
in and of themselves, they are complete, they are whole, they are totally filled out. How we perceive them, however, determines our experience with them and... And with life. With life generally. Yes, definitely. So let's describe them. First, the value absolute is the truth that our value is infinite and complete. How we perceive our value or worth can affect us and our lives dramatically, as we were saying. We're not talking about market value or usefulness, intelligence, education level, or anything else. Our infinite worth is not determined by external opinions, circumstances out of our control, or by what we can accomplish. Our worth is infinite, and nothing will ever change that. We are valuable just because we were born. All you have to do is look at a brand new baby to know that this is true. Mm, yes. Every single child that comes to the earth comes with this inherent, innate value and worth that has absolutely nothing to do with their capacity to contribute to society. Right. Even though, of course, the, the love of a baby or the beauty of a baby does bring its own totally. worth, right? <laughs> but it's not because they're doing anything special. Right. <laughs> Babies have three jobs, right? And they do them very well. And they just have to look at you and you feel it. And we will do anything for them yeah. just because they are that valuable. Yeah. There comes a point, though, in our lives where we start to question that yeah. value, where the value proposition for ourselves goes from just having worth and just being valuable. Just showing up as you. Just showing up as you, <laughs> just I'm here and I am me and that is enough. Right. To, and really, you don't even have that consciousness, right? right. It, you don't have that awareness. But once you start gaining this self-awareness and start comparing yourself or doing this self-evaluation that starts to progress as you grow up, it shifts mm -hmm. and we lose this sense of innate worth Right. to our detriment. Totally. There's so much conversation about self-worth and self-love and all the things that help us feel like we can show up just truly as who we are without apologies, without excusing ourselves because we're here and we're breathing the same air. I mean, it's it's a plague to some degree that that we all struggle with. And it really is something that is a common wound, a common struggle. And the more we can help validate each other, that it doesn't matter. It truly doesn't matter what all the external visibles are or what it says on paper or whatever it is the value of each individual soul is infinite and the more we learn to see each other that way treat each other that way and love each other and ourselves that way the happier more peaceful more validated more real we will feel like we can be i think Number two is the power absolute. It's the truth that innate within each of us is a tremendous power to have a positive influence over our lives. We can choose our attitudes, actions, responses, uses of time, priorities, and therefore many of our outcomes. Our perception of the level of our influence we have over our lives can lend either toward feeling like we can improve our circumstances or not, and feeling like a victim. Healing our perceptions here can build our confidence in facing life and making it ours. How many times do we enter into a situation or come out of a situation feeling like we can do nothing yeah. to make it better? Yeah. Or how often are we faced with a challenge that feels completely out of our power? often. <laughs> now, it, it is true that not everything is within our power to directly influence. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are things that we just can do nothing about. However, I'm, I'm reminded about 
that one line on Madam Secretary, mm. that TV show that we yes. that we watched, and she was faced with a situation which was kind of like blackmail. Right. And the person who was blackmailing her in this case tried to put her in a position and even said, you have no choice. Her response was, I've never met a situation where I don't have a choice. Yeah. It's true that she could not alter the consequences of how things were set up. However, there were certain things that she could influence within that so that at least she was taking control of what she could control. And it ended up working out, not perfectly, but she made her choice and she chose and she recognized where she could choose and where she couldn't. Yeah, that's huge. Our power to choose or choose our responses and how we show up, it really does impact how the dominoes fall. I'm thinking back to scenarios with our kids <laughs> where they say, but he made me mad. <laughs> right. But she upset me. And just how often we do things like that, where it's, it's obvious and clear from a parent perspective looking in that, well, she didn't make you get mad. Right. Or he didn't make you get mad. Or he or she did not cause this to happen. What happened was you reacted to it. Yeah. There's a difference between this situation and our response to it. We've talked about this. Yeah. And, yeah. So I guess I took the conversation a little bit narrow in whether or not we have power in something. Mm. But it's an illustration that it is very easy for us to give up our power in various situations, whether it's power to change your financial situation, whether it's power to change your job or work situation, whether it's power to change the relationships in your life or your weight or your health or anything else. Right. We are trained to not actually feel like we can influence our lives right. as much as we actually can. Right. Yeah, that's a big deal. All right. Third, the safety absolute is the truth that we are resilient in the face of challenge. This includes safety among and resilience in mental, emotional, or physical challenges, however severe. How we perceive our resilience and safety in the world shows up in how well we believe we can respond to difficult situations. The more we heal our perceptions here, the less intimidated we feel when facing challenges and the safer we feel overall. We will also feel more confident in setting goals and working towards self-improvement. This safety absolute really is all about resilience. Yeah. And even more than that, it's about our perception of resilience. Yeah, because we're stronger than we think we are. Just so much stronger. To Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> right, right. Very wise. Yeah. We can handle more than we think we can. I think what gets in the way is that we, we get hurt over time. Yeah. Things happen that that threaten us in one way or another or that diminish our sense of, of value or power. And when those are weakened, our ability to feel safe is also weakened. Definitely. Just thinking about a common situation uh, in, in the work world. You know, if you need to present something to a group of people and you've had bad experiences with a couple of them or even just one of them, all of a sudden making that presentation feels a lot less safe than it would if all, all of those people were sympathetic to you or that right. you had a good relationship with. Right. It can be threatening to have to call somebody up to make a sale or right. follow up on something if you keep getting shut down, right? It can diminish that sense of safety. Also, when you feel like you want to stand up for yourself in a situation, if somebody's not representing you well or they are you know, heaven forbid, they're attacking you in some way, there is a level of safety that is required to feel like you can stand up for yourself, that you can say something and it won't cause additional repercussions. Yeah. So safety and resilience is pretty pervasive in the world where 
the threat of something bad happening if we behave in a certain way can feel very real and shut us down. All right, fourth, the purpose absolute is the truth that we are all here for a reason. We each have a unique and special mission to fulfill in our lives. To feel we have meaning and purpose in our existence can be the difference between surviving a severe struggle or not. Much of humanity has a deep craving to understand who we are and why we're here. We need to know that we matter. It is remarkable how a strong sense of purpose can many times overcome weaknesses in either of the other three absolutes. Yes. If you feel the call strong enough, or if you have a clear enough objective and determination and meaning behind that, it can overcome whether or not you feel good enough. It can overcome whether or not you feel like you have power in your life, and it can mm -hmm. overcome whether or not you feel safe. Yeah. Purpose is that powerful. Conversely, a weakened sense of purpose can magnify deficiencies or wounds in either of those other three absolutes as well. Definitely. Well, this podcast is a pretty clear example of the purpose absolute being strong enough to overshadow the weaknesses I feel in the other three absolutes because it is that clear to me that this is exactly what I need to be doing right now, that the messages that I have to share and people I invite on have to share, it feels that clear and that important to do this, that even though I feel like, who the heck am I to, to have a podcast? And command the airwaves. Right. <laughs> and, and what influence do I have? Well, not a whole heck of a lot, but I'm realizing that this purpose kind of fills in those little questions. I have enough value to offer. I have enough influence to get to the people who need to hear what I have to say. And then with the safety absolute, yeah, this is super vulnerable. <laughs> I'm putting myself out there and putting my thoughts into canon where they can be reviewed and analyzed and critiqued and whatever else, it still doesn't hold up against the strong, clear purpose I feel in making it happen anyway. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're doing this. And we've already heard feedback from people that it has yeah. really, really helped. And so it's wonderful, wonderful that you're doing this. As you were speaking, I was recognizing that you know, each of the absolutes, value, power, safety, and purpose, when one of them is strong, it can help make up for the other ones as well. If yeah. we know somebody who says that she's God's favorite. Right. <laughs> yes, we do. And there's no pride or pretense there. It's just this contentment. It's a matter of fact. It's very matter of fact. And she's so lovable that you just exactly. <laughs> smile. <laughs> so whether or not she feels like she's powerful to do something or whether something is safe or has a real strong purpose connected to something, right. those can easily be overshadowed by this just sense of innate value. And the same thing with power. If you feel like you really have a lot of power to con in a situation or just in some aspect of your life, it can overcome some of these other things. Or if you feel totally safe. Yeah. Invulnerable. There Invulnerable. There are teenagers here. <laughs> you feel it. Right. Which we've all been there. And then <laughs> that sense of invulnerability definitely diminishes as you get older. But yeah. the point is, just like you say, a teenager feels pretty bold and audacious when it comes to taking on certain things that adults would raise their eyebrows at. Right. Because they've been there, done that, and they've been hurt. They've been burned. <laughs> right. So I love these four absolutes because it gives us a framework to consider what actually is true. Yeah. It gives us a new thought as to what the reality of the situation is. While our worth is infinite in one perspective, we also recognize that things, that either things that we do or things that we haven't done or choices that we've made or skills that we don't have 
exactly. There are certain ways where our relative value, our market value, our right. value to another person because of choices that we've made, etc. It does get murky. But our, if our baseline value is enough yeah. and can continue to move us forward. It's never diminished to the point that we can't pick right back up and keep going. Definitely. As far as the power absolute, we don't have absolute power, but we have enough power. Yeah. We have enough strength and capacity and influence to make things happen in our lives. With the safety absolute, it's true. Bad things happen. Yeah. But lots of good things happen too. And we can take more punches than we want to. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then with purpose, it gets muddled. It's really easy for purpose to become a little bit muddled with all of the different competing interests and voices and needs and responsibilities. And then all of the different tuggings we have from different directions can confuse that. Uh, for example, I guess I'm getting a little bit narrow here in, in talking about specific types of purpose, but there's purpose in, in a, a relationship between a husband and wife. Mm -hmm. The purpose of creating a family and developing a home and a legacy and all of that, which can sometimes be hijacked by the need to provide. Right. You know, uh, the way that somebody is able to provide for their family may take them out of, a home, out of the home a lot. Right. It may keep them away for ex extended periods of time, which seems to go against right. that primary purpose. And so that's what I mean by purpose can get muddled because of competing interests and priorities. Right. However, we can always tap into a clear enough and strong enough central purpose to our lives to bring everything together cohesively, brush off the things that are less important and and keep those those priorities strong. I love that. I love that you brought it to priorities because there is more than one purpose in our lives. And depending on the stage of life and our interests and our opportunities and our gifts and talents, those all influence distinct and beautiful moments of purpose or stretches of purpose that give us meaning in our lives. And all of these things, each of these absolutes, facilitate and orchestrate how much we believe in ourselves. And ideally, we have a perfect, clear, strong belief in the truth of each of these absolutes. It's not easy, but it's possible to start nurturing our beliefs according to these awarenesses. Now that you know that you're infinitely valuable, now that you know that you have so much more power and influence over your life than you realize, and that you are more resilient than you may have thought, especially if you're weighed down heavily by a current challenge. If you're struggling to feel a sense of purpose in your life or recognize where you matter in your life, those can all influence how you perceive yourself and how you believe about yourself. So let's, let's target things. Let's, let's shift into kind of a narrow focus and choose one belief that you want to improve about yourself. Just think about it as we've been talking, what's come up, what kinds of things do you recognize? Oh yeah, I don't believe in myself at all about that or I wish I had more belief in myself around this relationship or this job or this opportunity or, you know, whatever it is, think about one and we're going to walk through a neat framework that Chris will introduce that can help you make tangible progress in each of these things, which will then bless you and increase your overall sense of personal belief. I love that you're taking it to specific situations or aspects of life because I have found that at least for me having self-belief generally just that general pervasive self-belief that goes with me into any given situation is really a struggle. Mm -hmm. I found that it is more situational. Uh, there are some some cases where I, I feel very at peace 
Mm-hmm. There's no self-consciousness right. or negative self-awareness at all. Yeah. I have a handful of those those situations. But then I have others where I feel like a complete doofus. <laughs> And I have zero belief in my ability to do anything in regards to that. Advanced math being one of those, but that's <laughs> that's a, a whole different conversation, right? right? A different aspect of, uh, of life right there. So back at the same time that we started developing these ideas about the four absolutes, we also came up with, well, what at that time we called the belief formula, right? Yeah. A formula for developing belief in something. This framework is kind of a step-by-step how to develop belief, but it's also a theoretical framework for understanding what are the different components of belief or what contributes to belief or what measures belief, right. etc. cetera, in any, in any given thing. Mm-hmm. It's easiest to think about this in something that is external. And so, for example, I really like thinking about this in relation to golf. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because golf is a great testing ground for everything. And a great metaphor for life. A great metaphor for life. (laughs) Absolutely. I actually spent quite a bit of time applying this formula, this belief formula, to my golf game because it made sense and it helped. There are seven different parts to this belief formula. First, knowledge. Second, skill. Third, experience. Fourth, vision. Fifth, merit. Sixth, active agency. And seventh, capacity. I'll go into each of these really briefly. I could actually talk about this topic for quite a long time. I'll try not to. (laughs) So with knowledge, I don't know about you, but my confidence grows with the more knowledge I have. Yeah. So whenever you step into any kind of situation, especially a new situation, the more you know, the more comfortable you feel, the more confident you feel, the more belief you have in your ability to execute, etc. Knowledge can be broken down into at least three different categories. First, self-knowledge. Know thyself, right? <laughs> right. You got to know who, who you are, what you're about, why you're doing what you're doing, what your tendencies are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, etc. I, I love personality assessments for mm. this kind of thing. That's, yeah. that's one tool that you can use just to understand your tendencies and who you are. Just That's that self-evaluation aspect. Uh, the second aspect of knowledge is just general knowledge. So general knowledge about life and the world and all the personal development that you are doing in order to make yourself a better person. But then you get down to this very practical and applied knowledge that has to do with specifically what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Ways to gain additional knowledge include finding experts in whatever it is that you're trying to, to learn or do and learning from them. You know, what resources are there that you can go to to increase your knowledge, your knowledge and your training, etc. This step is foundational and leads to the next one, which is skills. There are two different kinds of skills. I like to call them perennial skills and executive skills. The perennial skills are things that, again, it's part of your personal development. It's, it's who you are. It's developing those high value attributes, such as patience, persistence. Mm, soft skills. There you go. So we're talking about also interpersonal skills. We're talking about interpersonal skills, but we're also talking about technical skills. All right, yeah. That are perennial, that may or may not apply to a specific situation, but to apply to a lot of situations right. generally. Right, okay, I see. So pervasive. For pervasive skills, yeah, yeah. they're ones that affect everything, such as the ability to keep a cool head, to have good judgment, do the, the seven habits of highly effective people, like Stephen Covey would talk about, right? right the right. ability to um, begin with the end in mind, to put first things first, to be proactive. Then the executive skills would be ones that are are really specific to whatever it is that you're trying to do. On the golf course, you can see both of those. Somebody who has the skill of keeping a cool head, they can take that into any situation, including golf. Somebody who can execute a a flawless chip shot, well, that's pretty specific to golf. That skill is very specific to golf. 
However, the abilities and capacities that lead up to developing that skill, those would be ones that are, that are more general. Right. So things like discipline, too. Right. When it comes to knowledge and skills, one of the questions that people have asked me is, well, how do I know what I don't know? Or how do I figure out what I need to get better at? One way to do that would be to create a, quote, job description for whatever it is that you're trying to do. Oh, yeah. What is it that you're trying to do? What are the objectives? What are the skills and abilities, know-how, etc., that are going to be needed in order to fulfill that job? Right. Love it. So if the job is to be a really good golfer, <laughs> what are the things you have to know? What are the things you have to do or be able to do well in order to do that? That serves as a basis for helping you know what you need to know right. and what you need to be able to do. The third one is experience. We all have different levels of experience and different types of experience that we have in our lives. And not all the time is the experience that we have directly related to the thing that we're trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. I would call that indirect experience. Yeah. I have seen that a lot with athletes who put a tremendous amount of effort into developing themselves within their sport. When they pull out of that sport, many of them have developed a great self-belief in their ability to take on a new challenge and succeed at it because they've done hard things. So oh, if you've yeah. done hard things in your life, then you can know that, hey, I've done hard things. I can do this too. And it creates a level of belief that helps you move forward. That's awesome. But then there is also, of course, direct experience where if you've done one thing well, then you know you can still do it well yeah. going forward. Uh, and it could be very job specific or very objective specific in terms of that kind of experience. That's looking backwards. But looking forward, you also need to consider what kind of experience you need to have. I would call this developmental experience. Mm -hmm. This is where you're looking forward to saying, okay, I want to be a really good golfer. One of the things that golfers face is pressure. So I need to golf under pressure more. Mm -hmm. I need to put myself in situations where there is something on the line. The point being that you can develop a tolerance for working under pressure, for golfing under pressure, for doing whatever it is under pressure. Haven't you talked about how when the pros get into the bunker, they're doing chip shots out of that. They've built up that experience and that belief because they've done it so many times. Yep. That it's just a thing that they do. So the skill has been developed to the point they, they know how to do it and they've done so under pressure in the past. So when you take all three of those things together, and you'll see as, as we talk about all of these, is that none of them is totally self-contained, right? Right. There's overlap. There is a lot of overlap, and they feed into each other both ways. Totally. With this idea of experience, knowing that you can do something difficult because you've done it in the past, really helps. Love so that. project to your future self saying, the next time I'm in this situation for real, what do I want to be able to do that I didn't do this time? Yeah. Give yourself some experience doing that. Give yourself some successes. Create a plan to develop that kind of experience, and it will help you going forward. Another kind of experience is, quite frankly, borrowed experience. You don't have to have all the knowledge and the skills and the experience yourself. You can borrow that from another person, mm. and you can lean on them until you can do it for yourself. So that's experience. The fourth one is vision. When it comes to going after any particular objective, I like to break it into two different kinds of vision, imaginative vision and strategic vision. So with the imaginative, that's the, the dreaming, that's the envisioning and setting the goal and why are you doing this and really connecting with it and what will life be like when? What will life be like during? And how is this going to improve my life or someone else's life or make a difference and really creating that that vision for where you want to go. Right. The strategic vision, that's where you put a plan in place. So you have to create these tangible steps that lead you towards what you've envisioned as the end or the product of whatever your pursuit is. Right, right. And then the fifth one is merit. This is that sense of feeling like you've earned it. I had a golf teacher named Larry and when I was really just getting into golf, trying to get better at it, trying to figure out how to play this crazy game, he really encouraged me to 
do some specific drills and to exercise. And something he said about exercise in relation to golf has always stuck with me. He says, you know, if you, if you exercise and work, work your body and improve yourself in that way, it carries over to the golf course because you feel like you've earned it. And there's just this sense of putting in the time, putting in the effort, putting in the work. And as you develop your knowledge, your skills, your experience with vision, it leads to this sense of having earned it. That can help build your belief that you're ready for something, right? Exactly. And that it, it could and should happen. Yeah. Going back to the absolutes, there's also this idea of intrinsic worth or intrinsic merit, I should mm. say, where just because you exist, good things should happen. Mm, I like that. Just because of who you are and how you live, you're a good person trying to do the right things, trying to take care of your responsibilities, keep your priorities straight. All of that leads to just this intrinsic sense of permission and, uh, and merit for things to work in your favor, for you to be able to achieve your goals or pursue your path. With active agency, this is essentially our capacity to choose. We all have a great capacity of choice, but there are things that get in the way. Sometimes it's just a lifetime of negative thoughts that have made it hard for you to choose positivity. Yeah, that's a big one. It is a big one. Sometimes it's you don't feel like you have permission to do something. And so something's holding you back, mm -hmm. right? But we have a lot of involuntary thoughts and a lot of involuntary perceptions, what we would call your phrenic system, right? Yeah. It's those thoughts that stem from beliefs that you have, whether you recognize that they're there or not. So as you're considering your, your ability to choose in your life, your ability to make a decision and move forward with it, to take control in one aspect of your life, consider what your involuntary thoughts are. Start paying attention to the, the immediate thoughts that come up. Huge. Pay attention to whether or not you're feeling held back by a sense of not feeling like you have permission. And then you'll be able to access more of your voluntary will as you can identify those things and resolve them. The last one is capacity. And this is more of a measuring stick. You can look at both your current capacity and your potential capacity. So, for example, going back to the golf metaphor, uh, I recognize as I, ch as I look at my knowledge, skills, experience, and vision, and merit, and all of those things, that there are certain things that I am capable of, and there are certain things that I'm not capable of. For example, I will never be capable of the flexibility <laughs> that I see some of these golfers have in their golf swing. Yeah. And just the amount of torque and force that they put into that, I'm just not that flexible. I can compensate for it, but there are certain things I'm never going to be able to do. Also, in order to become really, really, really good at golf, you have to have pretty much un unlimited time and unlimited resources. <laughs> right. I have limited time and limited resources. And so my current capacity to right. become really good at golf right now, or rather my expectations need to be kept in check because of my current capacity as I recognize that. But what is my potential? And potential is what we can focus on, our potential capacity. You think, man, if only I could do this, this, and this, I could accomplish this, or I could become this. That's your potential, but you need to look at it very carefully. Somebody who has a dream to be an NBA player, but they grow up and at full height, they're only 5'7". I only know of, at least in the modern era, two players who have played right. with a height of 5'7 or less. One was 5'7", one was 5'3". Wow. But it almost never happens. And both of those guys could jump out of the gym too. Amazing compensating skills. So you have to understand your capacity, your current capacity. You have to understand your potential. And this isn't a self-squashing exercise. This is an exercise in looking at what is real. Yeah. No judgment. There's no judgment. Yeah. But it's just really asking that question, what is your ceiling? Mm -hmm. Truly, what is your ceiling? You can get outside input from this. I do encourage caution a little bit because it's amazing how many people will squash us when they don't see the capacities we see within ourselves. 
or if, sense even if we just sense that they're there we sense it we feel yeah. it there's this desire burning within us or mm-hmm. just this just this hope that is within us that that we can do or become something i mean when it comes to to building a business to to starting to starting a business whether it's representing a product or whether it's creating your own business there are so many people who are going to look at you and say well, this is who you've been your whole life. What makes you think you can become something else, right? right. And we can do that to ourselves. Yeah. And this all belongs in that conversation about capacity, although it bleeds into the other areas sure. as well, so the other six. But it is really easy for us to squash ourselves because of what we see in the past mm-hmm. rather than really understanding the truth about who we are and what could be in the future with the right kind of effort. And other people are going to do the same thing to us, where they're going to pigeonhole us into what we've been rather than allowing us to become or supporting us or encouraging us to become who we want to be right? or accomplish what we want to do if we've never done it before. Yeah, they're afraid for us. And so they want to tamper our expectations and our hopes so that we don't get hurt, which is thoughtful, but not always the right approach. <laughs> that definitely happens. It also happens that people become comfortable with us in a certain space. Mm, yeah. And if we move out of that space, then it creates an imbalance for them. Yeah. And it also may cause them to challenge whether or not they're okay in their space. And, or rather, they've been able to resist growth. <laughs> right. But if you change, then it causes them to face the fact that they also need to grow. And that's uncomfortable. Definitely. And so there ends up being this codependency that is unhelpful at the very least right so those are those are the seven aspects knowledge skill experience vision merit active agency and capacity as you bump up one of them it helps others to grow as you gain clarity in one it brings light to the others and you don't have to have supreme knowledge supreme skill perfect experience, absolute vision, 100% merit, uncompromised active agency and limitless capacity in order to accomplish your right, goals right. or to become more, to progress, to grow, to change your life in any aspect of life or completely. But understanding what's involved, hopefully that will serve you as you consider what you want to be better at and what parts of your life you want to improve. Right, and as we think about that with building our belief in all these different aspects of our lives, including just in who we are and our possibilities of peace and joy and success and all of that, it's, it's a great way to nudge things forward to identify, this is where I want to increase my belief in. This framework can give great insight into teasing apart that mystery of, well, how do I, how do I build my belief in this thing about myself? These steps really help break apart the pieces so that we can see them, analyze them, process them, and make choices accordingly instead of looking into a black hole and wondering how the heck do I increase my belief here? We invite you to play with these steps. Really think about them. Break apart the different things that you want to increase your belief in. If it's believing in your value more, man, part of that, just believe us. Just believe us that you are of infinite worth. And if you're trying to increase your value in the marketplace, fantastic. What do you need to know to improve that? What do you need to gain a skill on? What experience, you know, what vision do you have to create in order to build a belief that you can accomplish this goal or this task or this job that you're looking at? Or my goodness, you young moms just feeling like you can be a good mom can take so much work (laughs) and feel so impossible spend some time here what kind of knowledge could you gain could you grab a book to help you feel more confident in some aspects of child rearing what kind of skills can you include do you want to be a better cook Um, 
so you see how we can break apart each of these steps with that desire to increase our belief in any given thing and even in the whole thing as we perceive ourselves as we desire to believe in ourselves as good worthy strong human beings this is a great way to process and think through and really make progress because it's no longer a mystery you really can shine a flashlight on the bits and pieces and the steps to nudge them all forward and really start feeling more confidence and feeling more belief in yourself you know this has been a discussion that there's a lot of detail there right yeah. there's there's a lot to process a lot to think about I, I would say that there are kind of three core principles that, that you need to keep in mind first belief is created through action not inaction so do something yeah like you said pick up a book try developing a skill watch a youtube video do something to in order to improve your knowledge and your skill Get, gain some experience in whatever it is that you're trying to improve in your life. Take action. Do something. Really, you're going to go through this process a lot faster the more action you take. Yeah. Which can be a little bit scary because, <laughs> you know, it's the, the, the ready, fire, aim sometimes, <laughs> right? The looking without, or the, the leaping without looking, et cetera. It can all feel like that and there, there can be some hesitation there. But I encourage you, just dive in. And, and take some kind of action. The second one is you really got to give yourself some time to reflect. Yeah. You know, action without reflection ends up just being chaos. But if you take action to a certain point and then stop and reflect and understand what you've learned, understand where you're at, where you're going, take, take a moment to evaluate, redirect. Yeah, are you going in the right direction? Etc. all of that. And then the third one, you really have to give yourself a tremendous amount of grace yeah. in this because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. You don't become excellent at something flawlessly. Right, I love that. And so in order to, uh, to give yourself permission to move forward, recognize that you're going you're gonna to fail. You're going to make mistakes, and it's okay. It's part of it. You haven't failed, though, until you give up on yourself. I confess that self-belief is something that has been a challenge for me pretty much my whole life. Maybe that's why I've spent so much time thinking about it. Mm. Maybe that's why I put in this effort to develop a formula <laughs> for belief. <laughs> And right. what's involved, because I'm trying desperately throughout my life to gain that self-belief and that self-assurance that, that I can do this. I am bolstered when I consider one exercise that you and I went through several years ago in a really neat, really neat seminar that we went to, where we were paired up with people and we were invited after we got to know that person and understand them a, a bit to write down how we saw them. I remember in particularly looking at one gentleman that I had been paired with for a couple of days and a tremendous amount of love that I felt for him with the trials he was going through and the amount of grace I felt for him regarding his weaknesses and his struggles and the goodness that I saw in him. And I was feeling really good about that and feeling really good about that for him. And then our instructor said, I want you to take a look at what you wrote. And I want you to know that what you saw in them is who you are. Wow. I forgot about that. So if you're struggling to believe in yourself, if you're struggling to see the good in yourself, then maybe look at someone else and find the good in them. And then take a look at what you see and recognize that that's who you are. And you can believe. Thank you for being with me. 
Remember to share this episode with three people who you feel could use it today. Don't want to wait for next week for new insights and wisdom? Go to www.tiffanygarvin.com slash emotional healing for a free guide to help you begin healing the emotional wounds that are holding you back. Again, the link is tiffanygarvin.com slash emotional healing. It will be in the show notes as well. I believe in you. See you next week.